Well, this is gonna be fun, isn't it? As ever, you already don't agree with this list because you're not me, and if you are, what the hell has happened? But throughout the years, there have been certain pay-per-views that have remained in my brain and not necessarily for the reasons you may think. I'm sure there are other main event shows that may be better on a more general level, but when you take the personal aspect into it, well, that's where the love is. I'm Simon from What Culture, and yes, this is my 10 greatest wrestling pay-per-views of all time. Number 10, All In. Surprising, right? I would agree. Despite only happening mere months ago as I say these words, All In gets an early shout simply because I was lucky enough to experience it live, and the experience of being there was like nothing else in wrestling. There was no cynicism, no negativity, no hardened fan determined to judge it before it started. Everyone in the arena that night just wanted to have a good time and support the performers as much as they could. It was utterly unique. It's why I actually got quite emotional during the SCU Briscoes match, which kicked off the pre-show of all things, because the audience was just so loud and so damn passionate. It hit me right in the feels. I also got a kick out of the classic bout between Nick Aldis and Cody Rhodes because I am an old man and I love throwbacks like that, and getting to see Kenny Omega take on Pentagon Jr. live is something I could cross off my list. That reaction to Chris Jericho's surprise appearance was the icing on the cake too. So yes, there are better overall events out there, but none will ever be able to replicate the feeling I experienced that night, meaning I'll always be a little bit biased towards it. Number 9, WWF In Your House Bad Blood. Another eyebrow raising entry, this takes everything I said about All In and pastes that onto a young Simon Miller who just couldn't get enough of this crazy thing known as pro wrestling. I was so desperate to see what was going to happen in the main event as Shawn Michaels took on The Undertaker in the first ever Hell in a Cell, I ignored my parents' warnings about not staying up for it, snuck downstairs at 1am and quietly watched the events unfold. And sure, after a reviewing recently, it's very much a one match pay per view, but nostalgia is a powerful tool and I'd be lying if I didn't say I got a huge kick out of it. Even the handicap match between the Nation of Domination and the Legion of Doom is oddly enjoyable, mostly just to see a relatively new Dwayne Johnson trying to find his way. There's some dross on it too, the DOA vs Los Bariquas has little to no redeeming features, but if the closing contest is meant to make you forget everything else and go away feeling awesome, then it delivered. Not only did Michaels and Taker just kick the crap out of each other, but there were no expectations about this giant cage and what they could do with it, which meant they had a free pass. HBK's fall off the side seems tame by today's standards, but within the context of this war, it's like his body exploded. Then, there's that ending. Probably my favourite debut in WWE history, seeing what appeared to be a serial killer make his way to the ring before tombstoning his brother straight to hell is a moment I'll never forget. Every time I see Kane deliver it, I feel like I've been transported back to 1997. You even get Max Mini on Bad Blood. That'll mean nothing to you unless the late 90s was your wrestling era, but what a damn hero. Number 8, WCW Great American Bash 1989. We all watch wrestling for different reasons, but most of us want to see top draw matches when it comes to pay-per-views that we're told should be considered as a big deal. That's exactly what WC Derby promised and delivered at 1989's Great American Bash. An event I wasn't overly familiar with until I was old enough to go back in time through the magic of technology and watch it, it's not only awesome from an entertainment standpoint, but also a small window into how the industry has grown and evolved. Every time period really does have its own style and feel. It was the last four bouts here that really took me off my feet, however, starting with Sting versus the Great Muta. I had no idea about the latter during my formative years, so that was an eye-opener in itself, as was my first exposure to war games, a concept so daft it could only have been born out of wrestling. Lex Luger and Ricky Steamboat was a treat too, and showed me a side of Luger I didn't know existed beforehand. He had been the narcissist up until this moment, but in one match I saw there was more in the tank. None of this could compare to what closed the show mind as Ric Flair and Terry Funk prove why they were considered some of the greatest talents in the world. The Nature Boy would retain his gold, but that was largely irrelevant all things considered. Both just gave it their all as soon as the ref told them to fight, and the combination of fluid moves, hard-hitting action and exquisite selling is ahead of its time in many ways. With a few tweaks, this could main event any show today. As a small aside, it's probably what I would consider essential viewing for anyone looking to become a wrestler, but either way, the Great American Bash 1980 may just be the best pay-per-view WCW ever produced. 
Big words. Number seven, WWE SummerSlam 2013. Another entry that gets a boost because I was lucky enough to attend, and that really does change your perspective of things in hindsight, SummerSlam 2013 is even more fascinating knowing what journey Daniel Bryan was in for over the next year or so. While he would beat John Cena for the WWE title in a moment that was like celebrating your birthday and Xmas all at once, the bait and switch by having Randy Orton arrive to steal it away from him as Triple H also turned heel was wrestling at its best. It took you on a roller coaster of emotions and left you with loads to talk about after the credits rolled. Let's not forget the match itself either. John Cena was at the height of his powers in 2013 and while we wanted Brian to get the victory here, experience told us not to get overly excited. In the big matches, Cena would always find a way to be victorious, mostly because that's what Vince McMahon wanted. Cena all the way, Cena number one. But Daniel did overcome the odds, and almost like a prelude to his huge WrestleMania win a few months later, fans just lost themselves feeling like we were all in this together. It's because we were kind of. Away from this, SummerSlam also offered up Brock Lesnar vs CM Punk, one of my personal favourite matches in WWE history. Lesnar hadn't conquered the streak by this stage, but his aura was certainly on the way back. Throw in that Punk was just the man at knowing how to work with anyone, and that he turned it up here something fierce. Properly brutal at stages, the result was rarely in doubt, but like the best contest, I remember the journey here. The destination was irrelevant. Again, it wasn't the best card in the world, but it was more fun if you were there. Bray Wyatt's first fight in an Inferno match against Kane was just weird, and Natalia vs Brie Bella may as well not have existed. But given that it also featured Cody Rhodes, Damian Sandow, Christian Rob Van Dam, and a very early version of The Shield, it's a bit like a modern day window into a where are they now. I love the whole damn thing. Number 6, Wrestle Kingdom 12. You can argue this forever, as I'm sure there have been better Wrestle Kingdoms match to match, but in terms of events that have got my interest, pulled me in and then delivered more than I could have hoped, well, that's number 12 in that list. Helped a lot by that battle between Chris Jericho and Kenny Omega, just so surreal to see Y2J in a non-WWE ring. The closing bout between Okada and Naito was just an education into how good wrestling can be and how special the then IWGB champ was. Designed to benefit from repeat viewing, the oddly methodical start is more than deliberate in order to allow the closing 10 minutes or so to absolutely shine. Every near fall was like putting your own life on the line, it was so nerve-wracking, and the fact that Carter pulled off the win when it seemed so likely Naito's time has come was just excellent discussion material after the final bell had rung. It was also special for me because I don't think I would have appreciated this as a kid. A mature event designed for an adult audience, Wrestle Kingdom 12 felt like it respected my viewing choice and wanted to live up to that expectation. It did which is why it takes its place here. I think only the current version of me would have got it. It also had Cody taking on Ibushi, which I love given how far the former Stardust had come, and the four-way between Osprey, Skull, Takahashi and Kushida is the equivalent of watching pro wrestling in Fast Forward. It doesn't make sense. Number 5, WWE SummerSlam 2002. If you like your wrestling pay-per-views to have a little bit of everything, I think that's what SummerSlam 2002 offers. As well as a returning Shawn Michaels having a ridiculous match with Triple H that made you cringe every time HBK took a bump, we also used this night to showcase Brock Lesnar as the future as he laid waste to The Rock to become WWE Champion and highlight just how good Rey Mysterio and Kurt Angle were. It was like a choose your own wrestling adventure. The latter especially is a masterclass in how to maximize your time in front of camera. While many have said they would have rather Angle and Mysterio received more than 10 minutes, it's that limit which sort of makes this so great. It's non-stop madness from the second the bell rings and you'd be hard pushed to find a scrap this good with similar constraints. If anyone ever questions how talented either men were, just show them this. I don't see how you can overly critique it. The audience at SummerSlam 2002 were also up for anything WWE was going to hurl at them, this being true of the main event especially. Fans were tired of The Rock at this stage, and the dynamic of the Great One being booed while newcomer Brock Lesnar was cheered makes for one hell of a unique atmosphere. The whole card was pretty stacked as well. There was Edge, Eddie Guerrero, RVD, The Undertaker, Booker T, Gold Dust. This may have been the tipping point for the company in terms of the Attitude Era boom, but it was a fantastic way to say goodbye to that and is still brilliant now. I have a feeling it always will be. Number 4, WWF Raw Rumble 1992. As a lifelong WWE fan, I feel a Raw Rumble has to make any list like this because it's the best gimmick match the company has ever come up with. A concept so simple and yet so satisfying. 
Always works, that does. Picking the best is an argument in itself, but I fall into convention here as I go with most people's choice as the Raw Rumble 1992 gets the nod. Now, nostalgia once again helps no end, but it's the increased stakes that are the real stars. Despite a roster of legends making up the match, the winner didn't just get a title shot on Mania, they got the damn title. This opened up the question who on earth would get the nod, and with names such as Hulk Hogan, Macho Man, The Undertaker, and naturally Repo Man, it was a game within itself to pick the victor. The fact WWE chose Ric Flair was just perfect. Long associated with WCW, Flair coming under Vince McMahon's watch was momentous anyway, but walking into his first rumble at number three no less and going all the way to the end, well that's just wonderful. Helped on endlessly thanks to Bobby Heenan on commentary and the always great Mr. Perfect, it even had all that nonsense with Hogan and Sid Justice. And again we can sit here and say that as an entire pay-per-view it was okay at best, but the rumble match lasted over an hour. The rest of the card almost didn't matter and if nothing else, it's so easy to watch start to finish. Isn't that the whole point? Number 3, WWF SummerSlam 1997 and 1998. Yeah, I said it. I'm cheating but I have a reason as to why, or I just want to include some elements of both into one entry. I'm sorry. Starting with slams in 1997, we've got to mention the poster because my word was that good. Showing a relatively mean looking Bret Hart staring out into the distance as the ominous presence of The Undertaker overshadows him, it was like something you'd see in a movie theatre. It instantly made me excited for what I was about to see. It was this match which puts the event over the top as well because I cannot tell you how much I loved it, especially in my younger years. The Hitman was my hero back then and as WWE started to tell this wonderfully complex story about Hart being a legend troubled by his future, I bought in hook, line and sinker. I hated Shawn Michaels, I was terrified of the phenom, they had gotten me. The fight itself rocks too. HBK plays the special guest referee perfectly, and the finish not only protected everybody involved, but set up everything that would eventually happen at Bad Blood, which yes, is also on this list. The spit, the chair shot, the hitman's pleased look as he seizes on the opportunity, it's wrestling at its best, and warms my heart just to think about it. The event will always be a downer in some sense, it was also the show where Steve Austin suffered that brutal neck injury which would ultimately call time on his career, and the rest of the card is so-so at best. But that's why it's combined with SummerSlam 1998. Now this is strange because in later years I came to realise nobody thought much of Stone Cold vs Taker, but I never got that memo. I was so behind the rattlesnake I actually leaped into the air when he won, and the bout to me was top draw because I was on the edge of my seat the whole time. Doesn't really matter what takes place from bell to bell when you're that invested, you think everything is legit. It also has a far stronger lineup because The Rock vs Triple H in a ladder match is a coming of age for both men, and Ken Shamrock vs Owen Hart in the line Den is an original and very well executed concept. WWE should bring that back. So independently they may not mean much but push your hands together and you've got gold. Number 2 WWE WrestleMania 24 Once again part of the, well I was there live and that skews my opinion category, WrestleMania 24 was still an awesome pay per view. Capped off by that emotional goodbye from Ric Flair despite not being a goodbye at all as we now know. It also had the biggest surprise of 2008 which was the main event between Edge and The Undertaker for the World Heavyweight Championship. Obviously that was never going to be terrible, but it reached such highs and served as such a good end to Mania that it was near perfect. Seeing the dead man etched in a purple glow as he lifted that belt above his head gave me chills and it kickstarted a feud that just got better and better. It was fantastic. It also featured a brutal clash between JBL and Fit Finley as they tried to murder one another, CM Punk won a great money in the bank match, and we had the successful oddity that was the big show going against Floyd Mayweather. Celebrities in WWE don't always work out, but this certainly did and paced out the pay-per-view excellently. It was like watching some kind of weird dream you'd had. Mania 24 isn't infallible as the treating of the ECW title can attest to, seeing Chavo Guerrero lose his championship in 11 seconds is as pointless now as it was then, but getting to sit in the Citrus Bowl for my first ever in attendance WrestleMania? I don't see how that can be topped. Even though it has, because number one, WWF WrestleMania 17. That's right, it's the most boring and predictable number one you can think of, but there's a reason for that. WrestleMania 17 is ludicrously good and features a lineup that has no flaws. It is unstoppable. From Chris Jericho to fitting the always underappreciated William Regal for the IC title, all the way through to Steve Austin winning back the WWE Championship and turning heel in the process, it's the finest pay per view Vince McMahon has ever presented and a show that is as good today as it was 17 years ago. 
And when I say that, I get the fear, because where on earth did that go? There's just so many good matches on it, and even those that are never spoken about still entertain. Eddie Guerrero versus Tess, for example. Is it ever going to win any awards? Of course not, but it doesn't bring the show down or suck. It's just another solid entry. Then, of course, is that TLC match between the Hardys, the Dudleys, and Edge and Christian. While, again, more has been done since this in terms of risk, few things will ever match the atmosphere and aura this has hanging over it, and the fans losing their sh** on every massive bump makes it even more of a spectacle. Every man in this clearly decided before they walked down that massive ramp that stealing the show was more important than staying alive. And if we look back now, we can point accusational fingers at Austin's teaming with McMahon, but that doesn't take away from the impact it had on April 1st in the Astrodome. It felt like we were watching something momentous, even if it wasn't the smartest idea in the world. A celebration of what pro wrestling can be and WWE's finest hour, WrestleMania 17 will likely, for me, never be topped.